is debatable. The biggest topics in music, past and present, discussed and dissected live with our music experts, original MTV VJ and 80s icon Mark Goodman. That's exactly what the boy bands are. I know, but they're but made up in a lab. And music journalist and walking music database, Alan Light. I don't think anybody, maybe anybody ever, has made a better pop record than this. And of course, you. Country, rock, hip hop, EDM, indie, alternative, pop, new music, classics. This is where your opinion matters. It's time for Debatable. Top five Tuesday. Top five Tuesday. Uh, man, oh man. Plus the, uh, <laughs> of course, the Cure consensus stealing the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction yeah. night and broadcast. And as it happens, that broadcast which premiered over the weekend mm. happens during the same week as a notable anniversary. Boy, talk about notable. <laughs> 30 years ago today, the Cure's disintegration was released. Uh, their biggest selling album, most popular album. Uh, it is. Uh, it's got three big hits on it. It is. Um, it was a, 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 in certain ways a left hand turn, or maybe a U turn. Really, uh, I think for the band, as uh, uh, Robert was was kind of freaking out over a number of things, as he is wont to do. I understand, uh, and that was reflected in the the tone of the album. But uh, I think that we have a great panel in uh, it's right. it's, to talk it's, about it's it. It's Roundtable Thursday, so we have gathered some forces to talk about that album, its creation, and its legacy. We've got Roger O'Donnell coming Start, in from Starting the band. with Roger O'Donnell, who plays on the record. Yeah. Let's, let's begin there. That's great. He will be calling in to talk to us. Uh, our dear friend Mike Pagnotta, not just always a pleasure to have him around and have him weigh in on stuff, but in this case... Was actually a part of the the rolling out of that record. He was representing the Cure as publicist for the Cure at that time. So uh, also a great person to weigh in on that. And then we have two rabid fans. <laughs> and then inevitably, <laughs> once word gets out, uh, you know, it goes without saying that we have to invite Lori Majewski, being the the Cure fan that she is, and. As if that weren't enough, Lindsey Parker, who is also, they're gonna, well, it's gonna be like, a, like a, a throwdown. Yeah, we're not gonna have, we're, we're just gonna have to direct some traffic. Yeah. we're not gonna have anything else to do <laughs> for that segment of the show. Lindsey, who of course flew to London uh, last year for the Cure Hyde Park show. Right, I remember um, that. That's commitment right there. It's dedication. And all of this with the announcement, as you just heard in that, in the voice of Ed Robinson in that yeah. news brief, that it was announced overnight. The Cure. Are are uh, doing oh, these, these shows si coming up where they're playing streaming. the full disintegration album and announced yeah. that the final night in Australia on May the 30th, they will be simulcasting and streaming, streaming that live. performance around the world live. So uh, depending on what part of the U.S. you're in, you can get up at about 6 a.m. Yeah, to catch I that. I haven't done the math <laughs> to see uh, I'm thinking, well, it's six. Work. I think 6 a.m. is East Coast, so it's probably like 3 a.m. Maybe just stay up from the night before. <laughs> Uh, for that, but it will be available. We understand for uh, some amount of time following on demand. All right, welcome back. Thursdays on Debatable, we do roundtables at this time, 5 p.m. Eastern each Thursday. And today, uh, a big day for Cure fans. Today, Cure fans, especially American Cure fans, because today is the 30th anniversary of Disintegration, which is the Cure's. Uh, I don't want to say their breakthrough record here, but certainly their biggest uh, and most popular record here in the United States. And uh, in order to uh, to celebrate that record and to just to kind of look back and, and think about uh, all the wonders that were packed inside, we have a great panel. And to, to kind of kick off the panel, on the phone from some unknown location somewhere in the world, Roger O'Donnell from uh, The Cure. Roger, welcome, sir. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh I'm uh, in England. So you are. are. Yeah. Thank you so much for for joining us this afternoon to talk about uh, about this record. Um, uh, you're welcome. Um, just like in general, when you when you look back, this was uh, it, for for uh, many of us, and certainly for you in the band, a transitional record. This was a record that seemed where Robert was uh, grappling with with uh, encroaching middle age. And uh, and probably several other things as well. He was well. only 29. He was, but he was about to be 30. That was the problem, apparently. Um, I, I, I don't I don't condone it. I just am explaining. 
<laughs> but I, I, I wondered, uh, because, the, you know, when, when people talk about uh, this album, they talk about the fact that it was a return to sort of the, the, the darker hues of the earlier Cure before you had joined the band. What was, what was your sense of things in the studio? What were the sessions generally like? Were, were you guys laughing or were you all sort of, you know, were the lights out and you had candles lit and stuff? Uh, no, we always laugh. It was a lot of laughing. Uh, we were in a residential studio living together for 12 weeks from uh, the probably the start of November, October until um, pretty much Christmas of 1988. And yeah, we laughed a lot. We always laugh a lot. We don't, uh, it's, uh, melancholy is deep within us. We don't have to. <laughs> It just comes out in the songs. Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, I, I want to, if I might, Roger, bring in the rest of our, our panel, uh, yep. a gentleman who you you may uh, be familiar with, uh, a gentleman named Michael Pagnata has joined us. <laughs> hey, yeah, Roger. we're very good old friends. So, yes. Uh, we worked together for many years. How are you, man? <laughs> yeah, good. good. And uh, a huge fan, Laurie Majewski, has also joined us. Welcome, Laurie. I'm also a big fan of Laurie's work. We all well, are. Aren't we you, all? Honey. Hi, Roger. <laughs> good to talk to you again. And, Hi, and I know, it's I know, Lindsay. Long, Lindsay Parker is going to be joining us as well at at some point. We're connecting, um, connecting to studio in LA. Right, Lindsay is in Los Angeles, so she will so. be joining us as soon as we um, hook up the Dixie cups, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but so, Roger, uh, the your recollections, great sessions. Um, what was you know as as you uh, were dealing with. Robert, what was his specific take on on things? How was he? What was his state of mind? Uh, it was pretty good. I mean, we um, we we would, it was uh, we we were at a birthday party last October, and um, we we talked about it. I mean, we don't generally dwell on the past and mm. talk about these kind of things, but we just were making the next Cure record. Uh, I said to him. Well, I actually, I said to him, you know, I didn't... Well, because it was the first Cure record that I played on, so yeah. I just thought that this was, you know, it was just the next record. And when you, when you look back at the albums that preceded it, you know, it was um, it was just the next step. And I, I didn't think that it was anything special. And I said to Robert, you know, at, at the time when we were recording it, everybody says, oh, you must have been aware of, you know, what an amazing record you're making. And I said, oh, I really wasn't. He said, well, I was. <laughs> <laughs> but he then, see, we never, we recorded the whole album without any lyrics and without any idea of what the vocal lines were. So we, I think it took on a whole new um, meaning once he started singing it. So, mm -hmm. And he obviously knew in his head what, was, what he was going to sing about, and we had no idea. Was that mm -hmm. the standard? working process that you would work you would get the tracks done first and then he would either write to that or, or finish over that uh yeah yeah in fact um it wasn't until uh the cure album in 2004 that he ever sung like during the process you know that we didn't finish the entire album and then he would sing on it so that's generally that was generally the process that we worked is there um, I wanted to ask Roger I at the time Robert Smith had talked about how Disintegration was going to be the final album and then <laughs> he and, always says that <laughs> but no us fans at the time were in mourning um, in fact mm -hmm. at the last night of the prayers of the, the prayer tour he was in Massachusetts and he said this is the last time you will ever see me and people were yeah. sobbing and for a while months we thought it was the end of the cure and then you announced Glastonbury do you remember you know you, it could have been a Ziggy Stardust situation do you remember when Robert decided now nah, we're gonna go on um no because <laughs> every show every night before we went on stage he would say last time in Cleveland last time you know uh, you know in New York and we just live with that and it was kind of like <laughs> Uh, I think it was his way of not letting people settle into what we were doing and to make 
everything special, but we kind of knew that it wasn't the end. But like the the last show, Raj, at uh, Great Woods, the last prayer short show tour, that did feel yeah. like the end of something. That was, you know... Uh, that was pretty much, the band pretty much disintegrated yeah, at that Yeah, exactly. It, it was pretty But that was just a moment. promotional disintegration, though, right? <laughs> just for the album. No, it was pretty heavy. That it was lot. Almost, almost good as his word right there. Yeah, a lot of um, stuff went on that night. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of stuff usually goes on at the end of every tour. It's, um, it's, you become very close with people, and then, and then it ends, and it's, it's quite a dramatic thing. It's, it's difficult to, to uh, explain it, but that was a particularly heavy, <laughs> heavy night. Yep. Mike, I want to ask you, you were... I, I don't know where this falls. When did you start a little working with A little the before band? me. Where I met you? the yeah. band when they arrived. I mean, they got off the boat, and that was the first time I met them. And uh, I, I kind of stayed in touch. And really, it was Perry Bomonte, who um, was the guitar tech at the time, who moved into the guitar pos- uh, into the keyboard position. Right, Raj? Um, when you left, Perry that, moved into Arguably. The yeah, <laughs> arguably. Okay, <laughs> but that but that was kind of so for me. It was a pretty it was a pretty lengthy process of uh, yeah. getting to the cure to represent them because there were lots of little obstacles you had to get through, you know, and to get to Robert. And, uh, you know, R- Roger was an early champion of mine, which I always appreciate. <laughs> I always appreciated. We always had a I good time. I always liked having Mike around. It was always fun when he was there, and he's got great stories, and uh, <laughs> yeah. we, had, we, had a good, we had a good time. We had a lot of fun together, and, uh, and, yeah. and with Perry as well, and, of course, uh, Daryl Bomonte, who had been with Depeche Mode and moved over to the Cure side of things. And uh, Daryl and I were close friends, and he's, of, of course, still very friendly with Roger. So that was kind of the way in, but this was the last record, I'd say, that I really enjoyed purely as a fan, although, yeah. I mean, I was there at the boat. I was at the Giant Stadium show that night, and then, you know, the last show. I mean, to my yeah. mind, that last show was one of the greatest Cure shows I've ever seen because I, I don't think Robert really wanted to stop. Did he, Rog? I mean, that, uh, that show no, went well. on forever, man. The lights came up, and he just wouldn't stop. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, I'm I'm thinking about how much it's costing us in overtime yeah. penalty payments. <laughs> well, you would. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got more of a business mind than Robert does. I yeah, think. that's right. <laughs> He'd come off stage and he's like, we'd be uh, like a minute before we run into over. I don't, you know, most of these venues we play are union controlled and they have a, a strict curfew. And then if you go over them, they usually charge you like a thousand dollars a minute for the first five, and then it doubles and then right. it goes on. And he's, we'd come off like a minute before 11, he'd say, I want to go back on and, and do some more. And I'd look at him and he's like, oh, come on, Roger. It's just, an, it's just a new jacket for you. Let's just, come on, let's just do it. <laughs> and everybody would be like, oh, whatever. But, you know, when yeah, he... When he play, when he's like a 20-minute version of... Um, of Faith. Faith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, 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 when he says they went over a little bit, we're talking three encores. I mean, an encore that, that was as long as the actual show. I mean, it literally yeah. went on so long that night that the lights came up, and Robert was like, fuck it, don't leave. And he just played <laughs> for another 40 minutes. It was insane. But I do, yeah. but Mike, you, if, even if you weren't fully on, on the team yet, yeah. you were starting Around to be it. in the circle, and you yes. were working in the industry yes, different. I, I mean, was. Laurie was a fan, just taking this as a fan. For you, with, you know, at, uh, and it, at least inside the industry perspective, what did you see happening with the Disintegration record? What did you see happening both in in the songs themselves, in the record itself, and also in what was happening with the audience? Well, I mean, I think, you know, as a Cure fan from all the way back, I, I grew, I, I watched the band grow, right? I watched them grow uh, their fan base. And, you know, to see a band like uh, The Cure as well as Depeche Mode, both of whom were my two favorite bands at the time, even though I was working with Prince and George Michael, you know, and getting ready to, to do the Stones tour, my heart was with these bands. So I was angling for every which way to get involved because you could tell that that's really where it was. That's where the excitement in music was. It was the point where alternative, whatever we call in air quotes, alternative music really came up from the underground. And that disintegration record for me is the most perfect record because it was, I mean, I was a big Pink Floyd fan going way back. And it was the first, um, I would say, alternative 
album that gave me the complete experience that I'd gotten from those records. For me, there's no doubt that Disintegration deserves to be spoken of in the same breath with uh, Wish You We Here and Dark Side of the Moon. There's no doubt uh, in my mind. But at the time, it wasn't seen that way. I mean, you know, they were still an underground act, even though they were playing to 50,000 people at Giant Stadium and 60,000 at Dodger Stadium. So what was your job then? Uh, my, jo- my, jo- my job then was getting ready for the Steel Wheels tour. The Stones were about to reunite. And uh, that was a crazy summer for me. I mean, we had this incredible press conference in, uh, you know, in uh, Grand Central Station, and it was insane. And then, you know, I have my mind on the cure. I mean, because they're coming, and I'm just thinking, how am I, you know, how am I going to work my way into this situation? And it was a couple-year process. And finally, uh, Raj, I mean, I, you know, after a number of conversations with Chris, and that, you know, that was always tough. Um, yeah. You know, it finally, I think at Martin Gore's wedding, I finally closed the deal with uh, with Perry. And that was when Robert and I spoke, and, uh, you know, and, and that's when it became official. Roger, I know you said this was the first, you know, this was the first album. This is where you come in, but yeah. I mean, how closely you'd been watching the band, or you know, being or being in the orbit of them, was there um, was there something when this integration was happening and it was starting to go out into the world, you know, what were you feeling? What were you seeing different in the audience, or what were you seeing happening to where the Cure was kind of fitting into the universe? Yeah, well, I I joined the Cure for the tour. Or kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. I didn't record on that record, so I was aware. You know, I, I wasn't. My best friend Boris was the drummer at the time, so that's how I ended up working with the Cure. And I was aware of them, like in the past, uh, but I didn't really know much about them. I, I remember going to see them uh, when they, when they were on tour with, with Boris and. Um, thinking, yeah, I like pop songs. Those dark, miserable songs are a bit long and a bit boring. <laughs> and I didn't really get the whole thing. And then uh, I was asked to join for uh, to play on the American tour for Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me. And they sent me a cassette of the record. And I put it in my cassette player. And you know, within 10 seconds of hearing the first song, The Kiss, I was like, I have to be in this band. This is incredible. And so it was kind of, you know, I toured with with the band on Kiss Me, Kiss Me, and after a couple of weeks, Robert uh, asked me, he said, I want you to play on the next record, and I was like, oh, you know, I was blown away by that opportunity. And then it was just, it, like I said, it was just kind of, we didn't think twice about it. It was kind of a natural, seemed like a natural progression. It was, it was, you know, the audiences were getting bigger. We weren't really chasing it. We were just doing what we did, and disintegration, we didn't go into the studio thinking, okay, now we have to make the next greatest album. We just wrote a bunch of songs and went in and recorded them, and that was just what we did, you know, and the response to it was always quite strange for The Cure, and Michael saying that we, you know, we came over and we played Giant Stadium and then Dodger Stadium, and I think everybody was a little uncomfortable with that kind of size of success. And at the end of that tour, we were like, you know, I think they offered us, like, to play for another couple of weeks and offered us a million dollars each and we we're like well no we don't really we want to go home now thanks <laughs> we just we were being very english about it and and just playing the music you know and the the stuff that happened around us was out of our control and we had no part of it really we didn't really get involved in any of it and that's you know there's not many bands that would go home when you're at number two or three in the billboard charts which we were at the time with um love song so it was you know like i said i can't overplay that enough that we just it was just like normal for us and i'm not kind of being weird about it it was just we were just doing what we did how do you uh uh as you stand getting ready to to tour on this anniversary and and it was just uh, we just got the word today that the band is going to live stream the the final night at these you're yeah. returning to the Sydney Opera House where, where you have been before playing albums in in full yeah what is it uh, it it oftentimes seems that bands you know it's it's sort of like a, a extra work you got to go back you got to rehearse songs that maybe uh, you, haven't you haven't played, played in years since, yeah. or or ever in some cases yeah. so what how how are you looking at at these 
shows where you're going to play this album in full? Well, we just did a week uh, rehearsals where we worked out some stuff that without giving the game away that we hadn't played before, and that was quite weird. Well, <laughs> because you're in a you're in a room not not too dissimilar from the room where we played it, which was in Boris's house in Devon, which is about mm-hmm. two miles from where I live now, and we're playing these songs that we haven't even heard for thirty years. And, we're, and it was kind of weird. It was, it was weird. And then you know, well, then we played some of the more, the l- lesser played disintegration songs, the album songs. And that was nice, just so nice to hear those songs again and to play them. And you know, the memories come back, flooding back from, mm. from being in the studio and, and all. I I remember recording every single song because it was quite, it was special to me because it was the first real album that I'd ever played on. So I remember a lot of the sessions, and it, it is a nice feeling. But there's also the other thing of, you know, we're a band, and it's, it's you know, we 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 should. It's about creativity, and these revisiting old things. I think you can get kind of hung up in that. But I know how important it is to a lot of people, and and it's a nice opportunity, and it's you know a spectacular venue to do it in. So. Well, you you had mentioned you know as you go to rehearse these songs that mm-hmm. you know memories start to flood back to you and you that indicates that you uh and when i mean sort of the collective you the members of the band wind yeah. up forming relationships with these songs uh yeah. in, in a different way than than fans do but yeah. it there is for us there it is a great moment to to go back and revisit these things especially for that reason yeah i uh, well i think i mean you know if you're a painter and you go back and look at your painting that you painted 30 years ago, you're not going to try and repaint it, are you? <laughs> That's the Joni Mitchell line, right? Yeah. Nobody goes to oh, a, is it? Nobody it's says, it's it's Picasso, Van Gogh, yeah, paint, Van Gogh. Van Gogh, paint Starry Night again. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so. uh, oh, that's good. I like Joni Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> like her a little little more now. Yeah. No, I always loved her. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, it's something that we do in music, isn't it? I mean, we play the songs that we wrote and have been playing for 40 years. It's not something you'd ever ask of any other kind of artist. Uh, so <laughs> it is kind of weird, and I'm more, personally, I'm more interested in cre- creativity and in, in creating. But but this has got a certain, you know, and I know it's got a certain thing to it. And we, I mean, we are, you know, we are recreating those songs to some extent, I think. And uh, well, you'll be able to hear it on the live stream if you get up early enough. <laughs> yeah, we've got to work those time zones. Uh, I wake up early. We, yes, you'll be fine. <laughs> we are yeah, well, I'll be on stage. Hopefully, I'll be awake. <laughs> we, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of The Cure's Disintegration album. We have a distinguished panel with us. On the phone, Roger O'Donnell from the band. Uh, we have uh, our, our pal Mike Magnata, who has, was working with the band uh, around that time. We have rabid Cure fan Lori Majewski <laughs> here on the panel. <laughs> And um, with any luck, she didn't bite me though. <laughs> <laughs> you're you got away. You're lucky. She's yeah, your girlfriend safe. with you. <laughs> no. We got We need so to take a. <laughs> we are going to take a quick break, uh, and Roger, we will be back with you and the rest of the panel in just a moment. Okay. Welcome back. It's debatable, and we are celebrating 30 years of disintegration it's the 30th anniversary of that cure record it's kind of hard to believe uh, but in fact it is 30 years old and i'll, I'll reintroduce you Laurie, to our panel Laurie Laurie is, is, here. Uh, is reeling over there with that information <laughs> well, it, it came out before you were born i, I, know. <laughs> I, I know was that. six let's not exaggerate <laughs> uh we have mike pagnata here who uh of course is a friend of the channel and and uh and the cures publicist at the time uh, yeah, it was not long after, actually. Soon. Yeah. Soon, yeah. Hey, I have a question, Roger. I should probably know this, but um, when Robert brought the demos in for the album, how much freedom did he give you? I'm not I'm not sure oh, that, that we... Roger's not... Oh, he's I, not we back? Sort of he's dro- I think we dropped Roger. Oh. I'm, I'm hoping he's going to be oh. back in a moment. It's, oh. He's there. Okay. Roger O'Donnell is back. <laughs> okay, sorry. Ladies I'm and back. gentlemen, Roger <laughs> O'Donnell <laughs> returning to the stage. Hey, hey, Ro- hey Roger, it's Pagnata. Hey, man. I, I, you know, I should know the answer to this question, but I always wondered how much, I mean, my impression always was that Robert gave you a lot of freedom in the studio because the album, the keyboard's so prominent, 
you know, you were so prominent on this record, especially, and, and it's such a particular sound that's the people that who know what you do know that that's your sound. But I was wondering how much freedom Robert gave you in the studio, how he, had, how much of the keyboard part he had worked out in the demos. Uh, and... Yeah, um, I think I, when when I was chatting with Laurie um, last time when I was in New York, we touched on the subject, and actually the demos, everyone's demos are pretty pr- pretty complete. And it's um, the parts are generally all there, and it's more about orchestration and voicing. So it's more about getting the sounds and like how how you how you put them together. Because uh, I mean, the songs that I wrote for the album ended up sounding pretty much, you know. And if if you hear the demos for them for the album, there's not really a great amount of difference. It, it's all about you know as i said orchestration and and making the sound mm-hmm. i was responsible for yes. crafting the sound i wanted to uh to bring in our final panelist happily we've got uh got our our technical things together lindsay parker is now ready to join us hi lindsay welcome Hi, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to talk about the album that Kyle from South Park said was the greatest album ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and you know, Lindsay, that we have Roger O'Donnell on the phone? Yes, hi, Roger. <laughs> hi, Lindsay. Hi. There you go. Wow, L.A., uh, I'm telling UK, you, New York. Yeah, that's it. That's the whole universe. Isn't it? <laughs> that's, all you, that's all you need. Can, can yeah. we talk about some of the specific songs yes, uh, yes. on the album? And, and... Laurie, Laurie, go. You, you... <laughs> no, that's exactly it. Taking Sit down from what, now, Laurie. What, <laughs> taking from what Michael Pagnata was just saying, you know, I was thinking about how Plain Song and The Same Deep Water As You, these are, these are rank as the greatest fan favorites of all time and they are so Roger O'Donnell you know we talked about <laughs> well we talked about the the kiss before and and how that is was up until this point the most epic opening of a cure record and somehow yeah. you top it you know can you can you talk a little bit about maybe how you decided for that song to open the record and and how it uh, came well, to be well that's easy it was Robert's choice. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, it... Michael explain. We'll explain that. <laughs> yeah, later. <laughs> hey, but, now let's not exclude our listeners. <laughs> well, no, no. That... Well, it's uh, you know those kind of running orders and lyrics and those kind of things. You know, that's, well, it's just um, such an emotional song. Mm-hmm. So you know how that song came to be because I think I've always felt, and maybe it's just because you know we've all grown with this record. That is the perfect song to set the rest of the album up yes it, it's, yeah, it's it's an incredible song yeah and, I, and, and it's I, an amazing song to play live and you know it, actually in the studio um robert played quite a, a lot of that because it was it's i mean it's, obviously it's his song and i played the bass part and i can't you know i put the sounds together but and it's one of Robert's kind of typical things where it's kind of like every white note on the keyboard played it pretty much at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just kind of watched and I was like, what? <laughs> and um, I remember that day he had a terrible hangover and he, was, he wasn't really talking. He was just, he, he would write me notes and pass them to me and I'd read them and then do what he told, do what he told me and then I'd ask him and he couldn't respond. <laughs> And he passed me another note. So, I, was, so is that, I, I had read about the fact that he went into this non-speaking mode. Is that what this is about? <laughs> is, is that true? Uh, I didn't know I that that was it real. Was a, it wasn't a mode. It was kind of a response to the amount of drink. <laughs> That's a certain kind of a mode. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. well, I, <laughs> I guess but, I mean my understanding from again from what I've read and I I didn't quite believe it was that there was mm-hmm. at this point in his his life he was you know he was feeling uh, uncomfortable about 30 uh, approaching and he was feeling um, you know a bit uncomfortable about success and he was just feeling a bit uncomfortable and and rich sort of retreated into just being quiet um well Robert ne- Robert never really talks very much yeah Okay, so it wasn't wasn't he as easy to notice if he wasn't talking? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean he he he's one of those people that says uh, what he needs to say and that he doesn't indulge in you know like idle 
I know, fans and like the rest of us, we'd Go we'd on. all be sitting, you know, talking. I remember when I joined, he said, I've spent the last year blocking Boris's voice out of my head, and now you come along, I've got to do the same. <laughs> so glad well, to have you in the band. Yeah, lots of welcome aboard. And, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. so, so there may not be an answer to this, the way that you say this was made, that you you know made the tracks and then he came in and, and finished the songs over that. But was there a song, or was there even a you know a moment in one of these songs where you sort of got a sense of, Oh, okay. I see what this record's going to be. No, no, <laughs> no. no. There was we, nothing. Um, there wasn't any kind we, of folk where it got came to focus or a turning point, and you thought like, "This is." I see what we're doing with this one. No, no. It was just like we had a bunch of songs, and they were all sounding pretty good. And I mean, we the, the we would record during the day, and we we would do drum tracks, drum and bass together, and I would generally play a, like, a guide keyboard line so that they knew where they were and then um so we would we we spent the first two or three weeks doing doing all the backing tracks and then every day we'd do that and then we'd have dinner at about eight o'clock which would then go on on to about midnight which michael can tell you about as well mm. and we'd get you know we'd have a few drinks a few. <laughs> and then we'd go back in the studio and play the song that we'd recorded live, um, we'd, and none of that ever got used because it was, you know, by that stage we could barely play our instruments. But so that was how we went about the the, the actual process of recording. That then, wasn't the question, though, was it? <laughs> <laughs> That's so, good enough, though. That was a great it's answer. An answer, but yeah, the answer to the question, right. but the answer to the question was no, that there wasn't anything no. in where you felt a, you know, uh, again, sort of lock in. Well, I remember Boris said to me one day, well, after, after we recorded the demos, we were, we were playing cricket in his garden, and he said to me, oh, I don't know, there's no bloody hits on this record. We're not going to make any money out of this. It's, you know, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. And, he's, and then, he's, then he's like, well, what about Lullaby? Yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, that's, a catchy, that's a catchy song. And then uh, Robert sang about you know, spiders and all this <laughs> stuff. I'm like, oh, that's that. That's that out of the window. That's <laughs> <laughs> that definitely is not a hit now, <laughs> Lindsay. I, I want to ask what what your uh, I, I guess your your experience may be similar to Laurie's in terms of uh, your first encounters with this record. What do you remember? Well, okay, this is going to sound kind of dumb, but remember, I was a teenager when this record yeah. came out, and I'd been following the Cure since you know maybe about eighty two, eighty three, and kind of seen, especially growing up in in Los Angeles, where they always had such a following because of K Rock out here, seeing their star grow. And when you're that young, you kind of are very protective of your band, and you know, as much as you might want to wish them success, at the same time, you don't want them to get too successful because then you don't want it to be no longer your secret, That's and then that, they only play weird, Dodger Stadium and the that Forum, weird and you never thing you people have, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm completely over that now and so happy that they're like the biggest band in the world and in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But when you're young, you don't feel that way. So um, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, the record that came out before was, you know, such a breakthrough record for them. It was like their first record to go platinum. And that year they played the Forum and in L.A. And it was I felt like the stakes were kind of high. I, this sounds so dorky to say now, but like when Disintegration was about to come out, I was like, oh, I hope they haven't sold out. I hope they're not going <laughs> to suck now that they're big. And then yeah, we I remember. We didn't, didn't no. <laughs> well, don't. I'm very happy to report that that absolutely wasn't the case because uh, sort of what Roger was saying was it almost swung even less commercial with Disintegration. And I remember waiting for the Fascination Street video to um, air on MTV, to premiere on MTV. And it came on and I was so excited and I'm like, wow, this is pretty dark and this is kind of weird. And wow, it's like two minutes in and like the words haven't even started yet. Just a bunch of like <laughs> really cool guitar noise. Yeah. And by the way, I don't recommend you do that song um, in karaoke because I have and I found out that you just stand there for two minutes waiting to sing. Um, <laughs> but I was just so, uh, I was like, oh, wow, this is actually beyond not disappointing me this is like surpassing my expectations this is like so good and then of course i i got the album and even though it did have um some pop hits that i also enjoyed like you know love song or lullaby or uh, you know basically the singles pictures of you there was also some super weird dark stuff in there prayers for rain is my favorite and i just remember feeling like you know just relieved i guess that sounds dumb but you know like i said i was a kid but 
then I turned around because uh, when Love Song came out, I remember that was a top 10 hit, went to number two, I believe. And the same week, if I'm not mistaken, the same week that Love Song was at number two, So Alive by Love and Rockets was at number three. And then <laughs> Love and Rockets really? and the Pixies. They were touring yeah. together, yeah. They were yeah, Love big, and Rockets. Really? That song was big in America. No, yeah. They weren't that big overall, but that song was. And both those videos went on MTV all the time. And then uh, The Cure played Dodger Stadium with Love and Rockets and the Pixies opening. And instead of me feeling like, oh, my favorite bands have sold out, I had a complete turnaround. And I was like, we won. We won. We conquered the world. Finally, everybody else gets that we were right. This is the best music around. And it was, so at that point, I was, I felt like really excited that, a band I championed for so long had done so well on their own terms without quote unquote selling out. Well, the, Ditto. The, actually, the night before we started the European um, leg of the prayer tour, we're in a hotel in London, and Ian McCulloch was there from uh, Echo, and what's his name from. Oh, that other band, whatever. And, it, and the president <laughs> of um, MTV. <laughs> was there and he we all ended up in this hotel room and uh so my job was get to get the president of mtv drunk which wasn't that difficult but anyway Les garland who's that i can't remember what his name was but it was a long time ago <laughs> and it? he was like yeah you know we haven't really gone into the alternative um rock uh, music scene and we want to use the cure as the vanguard and I'm the, that's a great idea. You've got to do that and just play our videos all the time and that's it. You've done it. You, you win. And that's what they did. And that, I think that's probably why Love Song went to number two or three or whatever it was. Number two, I believe. Yeah, I think it was yeah. number two. The Cure's yeah. biggest fan. Yeah, uh, Cure's biggest single. Song in America, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what that Lindsay was... says is absolutely true, though. I mean, like, one of the most intense memories I, I have is when The Cure started playing song at Giant Stadium, and there was just smoke. You couldn't even see the band, and it went on for a minute. <laughs> I mean, I think the smoke, Raj, went on for, like, half the show. And it was yeah, the I most... Yeah, I started in... unplugging the smoke machine. Yeah, right. But it was the most I've intense... It. it was such an intense moment, because here was this band that you love, that you thought was yours, and you're sharing this incredible experience at Giant Stadium. You know, that was weird. Bruce Plain Springsteen land, was, you know, it was we, weird. We'd just been on a boat for five days because we came over on the QE2 and, you know, when you were on a boat for five days, you end up having sea legs. And right. I, was, I remember standing on stage and the whole fucking stadium was swaying from side to Yeah, and the gig was that night. That's what was so crazy, whoever the fuck yeah, planned that out. Yeah, we got the boat at 8 a.m. and we went on stage at 8 p.m. Yeah. That was oh, it was very uncomfortable. Roger, we, we need to take a break here. Uh, we okay. only have like 15 minutes left if you feel like staying. I know we're supposed to let you go now, but if you feel like no, hanging stay, around. Stay, Roger, stay. stay. I'll stay. Don't worry. Oh, yay. Oh, Roger, <laughs> stay. Twist his arm. You can't refuse Laurie. Right. That was the secret weapon. <laughs> uh, we are celebrating 30 years of disintegration. Uh, that classic Cure yeah. album, 30 years old today. And we've got Roger O'Donnell on the line from uh, the UK. Laurie Majewski in studio with us. Lindsay Parker as well. Michael Pegg. And all star team. The all star cure fanatic team is here and ready to go. We'll be back after this. Welcome back. This is debatable, and we are celebrating the anniversary of the cure's disintegration. 30 years ago today, that album was released. And to help us celebrate, Mike Pagnato was working with the cure. Just moments after that album came out. Is that, is that fair? Yes. All right. Uh, Lori Majewski, massive Cure fan and uh, uh, the only person who will field 80s calls beside me. Shake it. Lindsay will, too. Lindsay. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. That's yeah. true. You, you route those calls to me. I'll take the calls on West Coast time after Lori's off duty. And, and there yeah, you have Lindsay, Lindsay Parker, Parker out there. And, of course, on the phone, Roger O'Donnell from the band. Uh, we, Roger, we were talking uh, off the air a little bit, uh, something that I thought was kind of interesting. We were talking about specific songs and the the tone of the record. And uh, Lori and I were saying to each other that there's a couple of songs on there that don't exactly fit uh, oh, really? the, <laughs> the tone of the of the rest of the record. And I, I was curious about uh, about your your take on that. One of them. For me, is is pictures of you. I, I mean, it's it is there is a sadness to it because it's sort of revelry. But I yeah. think I I really think that love song 
is not like well, the lyrically, rest of the, it is a love song, and the others are about falling. Well, you know, are more melancholic. They're exactly. Yeah, but Robert well, wrote that for his mention. wife for their wedding. Oh yeah, true. I mean, love song. Uh, we weren't that keen on that song. Uh, we didn't play it on the European tour on the European leg, and then Chris Parry, who we used to call Bill. Uh, I don't know why, but anyway. for reasons that are not clear now. <laughs> for reasons that were because we didn't like him, I think. And we ah, Bill yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, um, he said, "All right, we're going to release Love Song as the next single." We're like, you are fucking crazy. But I remember <laughs> Boris nearly coming to blows with him. I remember it very clearly. He's like, "That's ridiculous. You can't release that as a single. It's blah blah blah." And then also it meant that we had to make a video in between, in the break between the European and the American tour, which nobody was very happy about because, you know, we had like three weeks off and everybody just wanted to relax. So we had to make a video and then, of course, it becomes a massive hit. So <laughs> what do we know? Roger, I'm... Roger, I'm curious because that is probably one of the most famously covered Cure songs. It's been covered, sure. obviously, yeah. it was covered by Adele, and which you know was on this massive, yeah. like, 30 million selling album. 311 yeah, covered fine. it, and she fun fact, an it's the only Cure. With that cover, and it's the <laughs> fun fact, it's the only Cure song to ever be covered on American Idol twice. So really? I'm curious what, yeah, but well, someone sort of did the 311 like a reggae version, and then someone sort of did the. Oh Adele yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, and Lowe was. But in the it's. Video. Right, it's sort of been like, um, <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, it, it's reached a different audience, what I'm trying, like yeah. a pop audience through different covers and, and the fact that it was such a huge number two hit. So I'm, I'm wondering how you feel about the fact that other people, like what do you think of Adele's cover, for instance? I loved it because um, she, I remember bumping into a friend of mine, Jeffrey Remedios, who used to run Arts and Crafts Records in um, Canada. And I was like, yeah, Adele covered our... Um, Love song. I think it sold like uh, two million copies or something. He's like, "Yeah, think again." It's like sold thirty million. I'm like, really? <laughs> and uh, paid so, yeah, for the I'm, plane, right? I'm I'm very grateful to Adele for covering that. Like I said, she bought me an airplane. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's how it that's how it works. Man. God bless her. <laughs> so you talked. You said Roger that it's a little. You know that it was that it's weird to re-encounter some of this stuff to go back to these songs that. Yeah. You haven't played some that maybe, you you know, you played in the studio and then that was the last time you played them. Um, yeah. What do you hear when you go back to these songs? What do you hear when you when you dig back into them again uh, well, after all this time? I hear completely new songs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no recollection. <laughs> Seriously, there's a couple. I'm like, what? what? What's that? <laughs> I said to Simon, I texted Simon, I was like, well, um, is that us? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> So that was an eye opener. But what do you know? Okay, so even so, even more so, if you're in, if you're encountering them new, what's yeah. what's what do you hear going on in these songs? What do you hear musically in terms of where the band had, you know had evolved to in terms of the the stuff that Robert's singing about? I mean, when you when you uh, reapproach them or uh, approach them brand new, um, yeah, what nice, jumps out? It's nice when we when we learn songs uh, now, we get the. Um, stripped out uh like the like all of the different parts get stripped out and we get to hear exactly you know what you played in the past when you'd learn an old song you just kind of approximate it and hope that robert like uh, didn't pay too much attention to what you're playing but now he knows exactly what we played on the on the album so it's quite interesting to hear what what you played what was what was kept what was you know there's a lot of stuff that didn't didn't make it that got filtered out um but yeah, are, they, I mean, are there I'm, things beyond the uh the, the deluxe edition that was that was released yeah there was some weird demos on there right <laughs> was insane. I, was I like, have a question how did we record those yeah <laughs> Lindsay, roger i have a i have a question for you i remember when blood flowers came out robert oh, yeah. said that it was part of uh, i guess an unofficial trilogy that pornography disintegration and blood flowers all kind of yep. a common thing. I'm wondering. I'm wondering of how you, what you feel about that. And, and the new Cure record sure. has been described as going to be very dark and intense. Is it going to be like part four of this trilogy? Ah, part four of the trilogy. Well, then it would be a quadrilogy. <laughs> a quartet. It would be a quality. A quartet. Yeah. A quartet. Yeah. Well, I never really subscribed to that trilogy thing, but you know, it was good marketing too, wasn't it? Huh. Yeah. Neither did he. 
<laughs> can you, can well, you... you know, I mean, when you, what was the first one? Was it pornography? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were like, they were like 20 when they wrote that. So I don't, I'm, a trilogy is something that, that you do all at the same time, isn't it? It's like, I, anyway. I, Sounds I, really good, though. Yeah, it's a good From market. Helped, so Michael, Michael was, helped it help yeah. do your job. Yeah. Is that what you're exactly. telling me? Exactly, it was perfect. <laughs> I, I that, always yeah. felt. I mean, I always felt like Faith was a little bit closer in spirit to uh, disintegration, but he disagreed with me. So that's how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a surprise. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, uh, Blood Flowers. I don't know. I didn't think that was had anything to do with the other two. I, I think this 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 record, which I I I personally think it will be the last Cure record. You know, I know it's been said a million times before, but at this stage in our lives, um, uh, it's epic. I can say that about it. I mean, you know, playing it and sitting there and listening back to it, everybody's like, jaws were dropping. Uh, the, uh, some of the, you know, and we're thinking about playing, playing it live whenever we get to do that, whenever, wherever it gets finished. If this is this new record is epic. What what is the what is the the the, the ground for for this record? You know, if we talked about you know Robert's state of mind during the mm -hmm. the recording of Disintegration and so on, and so what is what is the foundation for this new record? Is there well, something think, that you could point to that's sort of a through line of some sort? Or I said to Robert a couple of years ago, or maybe three years ago, we were sitting somewhere I can't remember where it was, and. I said, we have to make one more record, and it has to be the saddest record that's ever been made. <laughs> and the most, you know, dramatic. And I think it will be. Uh, wow. Don't <laughs> hold me to that. You know, well, probably end up with of pop songs on there, but <laughs> at the moment, it's massive and epic. Well, coming off of the Rock Hall just a month ago now, what, was oh, yeah. did you... Was there anything you took from that night? And I, Nothing. I, no, stop it. And I know you said you're putting it up on eBay. I haven't seen it yet, so I don't believe you. Yeah, it's coming soon. I'll start no. the bidding. <laughs> I'll buy no. it. No. But, bid is zero. But the thing is, I know, I know you're a little cynical about it, but when you were actually on that stage and you guys did such a great job, and did you as a band leave that night and, and go back, whether it's you're going to mix this record or something, are you recommitted to The Cure? Now, now that you saw no, the that love that no night, on, that well, personally, it had no effect on it. my uh, the standing that the Cure has in my life, and what my opinion of what we've done and how we're perceived. Uh, that was I had absolutely no bearing on anything. It was just a load of self-congratulatory nonsense, as far as I was concerned. Well, I have to it's say, Alan Light is here, and he is the one that put you forth <laughs> for the for, for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He fought hard to get you in, Roger. Uh, hey, so we can take that's it. great. I'm, I'm, we can take it back if it the, makes you happy. It's you know. <laughs> and I'm the one. I just want to say I'm the one that got Eddie tr convinced Eddie Trunk to vote for the Cure. I just want to say I'm the one that twisted his. Listen. Eye. Well, I'm glad that you're happy that you did it. <laughs> it was nice of you to show up, Rod. <laughs> uh, I you, didn't have a choice. Did right, right. <laughs> uh, you know, when I saw Robert a couple of years back, um, uh, Laurie was with me, actually, and he mentioned he was going to be making this record, and he did say that he felt that he should be making the record with this lineup. I mean, it, yeah. what is it about this lineup that makes him so happy and so confident about recording this we record? We don't argue. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All the poisons out. It's um, you know, we were in rehearsal, like I said the other week, um, in Bright, um, in a town somewhere in England, <laughs> and uh, we went back to the hotel after uh, Simon, Jason, and I, and we were in the bar and we were talking, and there was just a degree of honesty and friendship between us that was just that we've never had before, and I think that that permeates through the whole band. Hard to imagine and that Jason's been in for 23 years now, right? I mean, I he's like the new guy, and he's been, you know, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, it's like, um, what's his name in the Rolling Stones? You're right, Ronnie Wood. Ronnie Wood, <laughs> that's the guy. Still the new kid. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, we've just, uh, when I when I rejoined in 2011, I, I you know, I talked to Robert, and he's like, well, if we can't get on now at our age, you know, you, we never will. So 
we're at a stage where we're all very comfortable with each other. We know what we can do. We know what each other's good at and how they play. You know, we know what Robert wants. I personally know when I'm working with the Cure, I know exactly what he wants and what I can give him and what I can bring to the Cure. And everybody else in the band knows that as well. And it's just a very, very comfortable place. We're all very comfortable with where we are and what we're doing. And I think it's interesting and difficult for a band to reach that kind of stage in their career. Oh, well, I use the word career loosely. <laughs> 40 years oh, in. Come on. 40 years on. I think it earns that title I, at this I, point. I think yeah, at this I point so. it does for well, sure. I, somebody said to us about playing the Rock Hall of Fame, they're like, wow, you know, it's going to be great. Loads of people are going to see you play and it'll be really important for your career. And I said to her, but since when did we give a fuck about our career? <laughs> and he was like, yeah. Uh, we we are going to wrap up this round table, Roger. Um, okay. We uh, we we thank you so, so much, much for taking yeah. some time. I I we, we, I didn't think we were going to talk about the Rock Hall specifically, but uh, yeah. it was such a great night for us. Uh, I hope it was a great night for you. There was, oh, I loved every minute. It, it. it was one of the most moving moments in the entire sh entire show w when Robert came out and was so moved by the the crowd's response, and it was a great thing to see. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. We are looking forward to that live stream. We're looking forward to the new album, to which is coming out when shows. again? When's when's that new album coming? Um, who knows? <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> Meanwhile, people, Halloween, yes. people, Louis, uh, people Louis should knows. check Louis out. Knows. <laughs> okay. Meanwhile, people should check out your solo stuff. Any Cure fan out there should pay attention to Roger's solo oh, stuff. That's, that's terrific. Nice. See, Michael is such a good market. <laughs> he does I his love job. you, man. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. You. And we hope to have you back. Speak soon. To talk about your solo stuff. <laughs> yeah. Anytime. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. See ya. See ya. Stand by. We're coming back with overtime here on Debatable. Welcome back. It's Debatable. And our Thursday roundtable. We've been celebrating the 30th anniversary of The Cure's disintegration with Mike Pagnotta, who... Uh, Shortly after the release of that album, uh, Mike was working as their publicist. Somewhere in here enters the uh, the, the, the cure the, the sphere bubble. The, yeah, the bubble. Yeah, I enter, entered the picture. <laughs> Lori Majewski is here in studio with us. Uh, I just have to tell you that I walked yeah. in. Johnny Marr was here. I know. How okay, cool was it? we're talking about the cure. We had Roger O'Donnell on, and right after this, I'm going to see the opening night of Morrissey Mars. on Broadway. Is this my best day ever? <laughs> what? Right. What, year? what year is, is it? Yes. Right? Let's not get excited yet. We're not. We're not sure if Morrissey's going to show. So we'll see. Uh, check the Vegas. Is. Check the Vegas odds. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> uh, but we, we, I wanted to put the number up because I, I know it's a, it's a pretty important record uh, in the in the Cure's discography here in the U.S. Uh, if you have uh, some feelings, some memories, some remembrances, eight four four six eight six five eight six three, or tweet us at Sirius XM Volume. What did this record? What did this record mean to you? What did this record mean for you? And mean for you know for music going forward from there. And Lindsay Parker is still with us, right Lindsay? Hello. Yep. Now I'm so here. Lindsay and I should mention this. Lindsay's in LA and you Lindsay you mentioned the Cure and the Dodger Stadium gig. Oh, yeah. I, I think that the people outside of LA don't realize what the Cure is in LA. Well, it's interesting They're because, like the Beatles. Um, Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a very distorted idea in general of how big certain bands were because I grew up with a station that's still very popular right, in right. L.A., but in the 80s and 90s was everything. It was called K-Rock, right. K-R-O-Q, and they played a lot of those kind of uh, British invasion bands, the, the holy trilogy, basically, of Depeche Mode, The Smiths, and The Cure, but also New Order, Echo and the Bunnymen, you know, uh, bands like that. And they pretty much dominated my childhood, and those bands still have a massive following in L.A now because of the people of uh, I guess Gen X that grew up with those bands yeah for instance a couple years ago Lori was there with me uh, at one of the shows Depeche Mode played four nights in a row at the Hollywood Bowl all sold out yeah. and that was the f they're the only band in the history of the Hollywood Bowl to do that um, the Cure played three nights at the Hollywood Bowl in 2017 so I grew up with, you know, I'm so grateful now, I, I took it for granted at the time, that I was exposed to a lot of this music because of K-Rock. And um, in the U.S., like, L.A. is still the biggest market for bands of that genre, of that era, because right. of Wasn't it right around, right around the time of the release of this Cure record, within, uh, I want to say within a year or two, there was, uh, was it 
I can't remember which Depeche record, but Depeche did an appearance, and they crashed through at the warehouse, yeah. at the warehouse and they crashed through a plate out. glass. Oh window. yeah, they had to be helicoptered I mean, out. It was like a riot. Yeah, there was a riot. Actually, on it's La really <laughs> Mark. It's really funny that you mentioned that because I remember at the time that was on the local news here, and yeah. the um, you know normally when they report on a riot, the newscasters are kind of grim and and very like, oh no, this is really dangerous and bad. <laughs> but there was a real amusement, like oh, a bunch of weird guys with hairspray and makeup. <laughs> Look at them, these harmless little skinny things running around La Cienega creating a riot. Right. But they literally did. Um, but no one, I guess, was too scared. I have all that footage <laughs> on three-quarter inch tape. Still. Three no volumes. Way. I have it all. I do. Yeah. Oh Every bit God. of it. All oh the band's God. footage. Got a I was not there. There's no incriminating footage of me. I was not in the Depeche Mode riot. You know, so she I, mentioned I, well, she I'm, mentions I'm K-Rock. I'm surprised and a little disappointed that you weren't there, yeah. by the way. I don't. Well, I must uh, have had something else to do. I don't know why I wasn't. You know what? I think I might have heard word that it was going to be too crazy, and I just decided. Maybe I was scared of being trampled by a bunch of Depeche Mode fans. Well, Lindsay mentions uh, K-Rock, and we, here in New York, we had WLIR, and Laurie and I were both in that documentary, and that is literally, for us, why these bands feel so big, and I think once you get out of New York and L.A., and also Texas, I have to say, people don't understand, I can tell you from working with these bands, that Austin, Dallas, and Houston are enormous markets, Salt Lake City as well, for bands like these, but Erasure, Depeche, and The Cure in particular. And The Cure just oh, announced God, Erasure. Austin City Limits yes. that they're going to be they, playing. Yep. They will be right. headlining. Right. Erasure would... and the Pet Shop Boys were on K-Rock so much. That they might, it, it, it was like the Sirius XM Pet Shop Boys station. It was yes. all Pet Tra- Shop Boys. Single after single. It was amazing. Very, tweet, great, very grateful for that station. Quick tweet from Zerbity Blurb that may just be a statement or a question. Uh, I always thought Disintegration was an unofficial concept album chronicling the disintegration of a relationship which was based around what was happening in Robert Smith's life. Every song tells a chapter of the story which has some ups, but mostly downs. Fabulous B-sides as well. Do you guys think... To- do, yeah, do you guys think of it in those in those terms? Well, what I think is interesting is if there is that theory, then there's kind of a happy song in the middle because we uh, we were talking about love song before, and yeah. you know, love song is sort of the the pop song, kind of like when a heavy metal band has all these hard rock songs, but then they have a hit with their power ballad, like when Extreme have a hit with more than words, and it sounds like nothing else. Um, but that song was written for Mary Poole, Mary Smith, Robert's wife, as her wedding gift when they got married in 1988. And that's it's interesting because we were just talking about Johnny Marr, and he met his wife when he was like 15, and they've been together ever since. What is it over there with these like faithful men in England? Because Robert Smith, Robert Smith met Mary, his wife, okay. when they were Wait 14 a second. years old. You're going to take these two guys as representative <laughs> of all of the rockers in saying. England? No, I guess they're they're definitely the exceptions to the rule, yeah. but they're you know I it's such a it's a beautiful love story. I wrote about it for Yahoo today. So Robert Smith and Mary met in drama class when they were fourteen years old. Um, I'm sure they've had their ups and downs, but they've been together ever since. Or you know they're married now. They've been married since 1988. Um, and if you watched the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which when it aired uh, last week on HBO, it went viral. This one screenshot of Mary watching Robert give a speech. I'm like, find yourself. Some Someone who looks at you the way Mary Poole looks at Robert Smith. And when you know that background, that this was a song about, you know, at this point, Robert and Mary had already been together for half their lives for like, you know, 15, 16 years. And this was his wedding present to her. And that's why it maybe in some Cure fans opinion is a little sappier or poppier than some of the other darker lyrics the Cure are known for, certainly on Disintegration. And when you know all that background, it's like, Oh, it's just nice. I just, I, they're goals. They're hashtag couple goals. I think it's a record about leaving is really what it is and the ending of things. And it doesn't just apply to a relationship, although I've also suspected for a long time that it did. I think it also had to do with the condition of the band at that time, which was not very good. There was a lot of tumult and turmoil. And at the well, end Lal was fired. Yeah, Lal was right? fired. I mean, I think he's credited to other he instruments is, on is one track. On the, on the but yeah, but it, I yeah. mean, it was it was very spiteful the, in the way in which he was credited. It, it, it wound up in a legal suit. Roger left at the end of that tour. Um, it wasn't a very happy time. And I think that Robert legitimately was miserable about the commitment that he had to make to the band because the bigger they got, um, the more upset he became. And he wasn't mm. kidding. And that was one of the things that made my challenge so great was that he really didn't want to have anybody pushing the band. Yeah. He didn't like it, you know. But I guess at a certain point, you need somebody to do that kind of work. So. And I, I, I love the fact that Roger actually mentioned the idea that the band 
as a band kind of got over this fear of fame and success yeah. there was a resentment actually was, yeah, about their better, own success better than fear. i mean yeah. that's yeah it was a, it was an actual resentment and it was a, it was a huge battle internally it, it's still a battle for robert i mean I, I think that's why when he was at the rock and roll hall of fame you saw him answer questions in the way that he did it doesn't mean to be ornery or difficult it's just the way he is but he did want to be in the rock hall i mean he one of the first people he thanks is rob light from caa mm -hmm. right. and he Rob Light's the one that worked, right, to also get them into the Rock Hall. I mean, uh, that's well, someone... has been booking them forever. You know, right, her. so... But I had a, actually a question for Alan, yep. because we've all talked about our obsessiveness and how much we love this group. And first of all, I wanted to publicly thank you. I've been wanting to thank you publicly for a while, because I know that you championed The Cure this year, and I know that you didn't always understand them. What was it like for you in 1989 when this album came out? What was your... What, how did you feel about The Cure? I've said this before, and I and I can't. I'm I, I did advocate for them, and I was not alone. There were others in there who fought for them extra hard this year within the nominating room. So you're welcome. But it's not. This was not a one man. It, this was not a one man from someone crusade. Who's not a cure person. But that was. But I framed you it. You probably from counted saying, a lot. Yeah. Well, I I started this by saying this is not, you know, one of my bands. But what I see is what it is that they've meant, what this impact has been, what this legacy has been, how important they are. Um, you know, I've just said it, I think, the other day when we were doing top five New Wave songs, that this I, it, I came to The Cure really late, which in some ways is kind of great because I feel like I'm still discovering this band. Like, I'm not all the way deep in through this discography at all. Um, my son has gotten really into them. We've been listening. Oh, yeah, he loves them. And we've been listening a lot. And even though he's a very, like old school classic rock guitar head guy he is really into this band so we've gotten we've spent a lot of time listening to them but you know 1989 is is funny for me this is when i start at rolling stone i mean it's li when i literally when i come on staff at rolling stone in 1989 and so much of my i mean i did a lot of other things there but so much of my crusade at that time in that place was fighting for hip hop getting attention in those pages. I mean, 1989, we're at the absolute glory days of like the greatest, I mean, 1988, I will argue, is the greatest year in the history of hip hop. But we're talking about, you know, Public Enemy and De La Soul and NWA and LL and Tribe Called Quest and like the greatest moment. And I, that was where so much of my attention was. It was what felt the most exciting and vital and new to me. And I was pushing to get the, the attention that I wanted it to get in those pages. So a lot of the rock stuff, I had said I had a bad attitude about Nirvana. You know, <laughs> when Nirvana broke, there was that sense of like, oh, come on, you guys. Like, yeah, they have one big song. Does this really mean rock and roll is, but you want it so bad. Meantime, there's all this other great stuff that you're that I'm having to convince but you cr about. Critically, you weren't alone, and this is like the most ironic thing about this whole discussion that we're having is that we're heaping well, all this I'm, praise on this band and this just, album that at the time really couldn't get arrested. I by just pulled up. I just pulled well, coming, I just pulled yeah, up. Yeah, I was just going to say coming into this album, yes, Mike, that's I just the case. Pulled yeah. up the Rolling Stone review of Disintegration, which was a three and a half star review. It was yeah. like a what? Well, Rolling okay. Stone, let's let's okay. face it, alternative music and grunge, Rolling Stone was the last people on the bus. Okay, but in they I... were so old. I was I was reading Spin <laughs> at that time because Rolling yes. Stone sure. could not they couldn't yeah. be they were beyond last in line. They were like on the next town and they were so old <laughs> at that point that it but, did, they didn't speak to me at all. But, but what was but where was the impact? Where was the Michael you were you're you're working this stuff. Yeah, I mean that that was the thing. I mean, I've told my Euroweenie stories before. <laughs> I've told it to Lori. Um, you know, Depeche Mode at the time and you know REM, you two had already kind of happened, right with Joshua Tree? Oh, by then. So yeah, yeah so it's coming, you know, all this stuff that was LIR and K-Rock stuff is now coming Kind of coming onto the mainstream MTV is really responsible largely for that but yeah getting the critics to pay attention especially to bands like Depeche Mode and The Cure who I were working with even Morrissey was almost impossible with Prince it was no problem I mean the phone calls it was constant for me you know it was a matter of which cover do I want to do when and I'm not even going to do a photo shoot so fuck you <laughs> that was kind of the way that was but for The Cure and Depeche it was a completely different thing and that was the music that was closest to my heart and trying to get people to to, to agree with me that Disintegration or Wish that followed it was this incredible epic album just nobody wanted to hear it. They just didn't.
Uh, we're, we're talking about the Cure's Disintegration album, which turns 30 today. We just, uh, we're just we in kind of overtime for our roundtable. And uh, if you want to weigh in, 844-686-5863 or at Sirius XM Volume. Rick in Virginia, you're on with our panel. Hey, guys. How, how's everybody doing? doing Good. Great. Welcome. Good. Great. Hopefully my phone my phone's kind of acting weird and we're getting storms down here, but uh, hopefully I can get through this. Okay. Hey, um, hey um, yeah, when disintegr- I just wanted to share some memories about disintegration. When it came out, I was 18 when it came out, and I was just a, into classic rock, hard rock, just guitar-driven rock. And I had friends that were into The Cure for years before that, and I would, so I would hear songs here and there and see clips of them and everything and thought, well, they're just not for me. But something about Disintegration, though, when that came out, when I heard Fascination Street, you know, in advance of the uh, of the record coming out, I just that just did something for me. I went out and bought the album in May, and, uh, you know, a couple of weeks after it came out. And I'll tell you, it's just that album is just pure perfection for me. <laughs> I mean, it's. I mean, just every track on it. I mean, I couldn't believe it because I was so into guitar heavy rock, and that was such a keyboard heavy album and everything. But there's something about the atmosphere, the songs, the you know Robert's vocals and the, everything they layered on everything. It was just amazing. And what and from that day, well, actually seeing them live on the Prayer Tour, I went ahead and bought a ticket and went to see them. And seeing them live just. They became my. They instantly became my favorite band in the world. Wow! At that point, that's a great just, story. That's, it, it that's was, something. Yeah, it was just amazing. I mean, seeing the way just Robert Smith could just. I mean, he had the crowd in the palm of his hand, basically. I mean, every move he made was just. You know, everybody was all eyes were on him, and I mean, the whole band. I mean, they sounded great on that tour. Yeah, and you know, I've seen them probably sixteen times since then, and it's like I mean, they always sound great live, but. But that, but that tour, I mean, it, it, and, you know, I turned on some friends of mine that were like, oh, you, you listen to The Cure, what are you talking about? I said, no, you've got to listen to this record, you know, and there's, there's something about that record that just, you know, it's, maybe it's just because it's not like, you know, everybody thought, well, oh, they're just some quirky little pop band, you know, from the singles, from the previous singles or whatever, or they're so mopey and gloomy, but there's just the, something about the songwriting on that record and the performance on that record and everything just it just clicked and it well you're not alone me around. yeah <laughs> there's a lot of people who feel that way uh i appreciate the call rick thank you man all right thanks guys all right uh, i have a funny story about how that that album disintegration is so widespread is real quick when i was out in new york for the rock and roll hall of fame uh last month uh, a couple days, the same day, actually, Friday, I was at Build Series where I sometimes do interviews, and I was interviewing Jake Owen, who, if you know who he is, he's mm-hmm. like about as mainstream country as it gets. And we were making a little bit of small talk before we went on to do the interview, and I said I was in town because I was going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that night. And he instantly brightens up and he goes, are you going to see The Cure? <laughs> like he was, you know, the last person you would think, right, uh, would be a huge Cure fan. He's, I'm like, hell yeah, The Cure's the main reason I came out. And he goes, what's your favorite What's your favorite Cure record? Mine's Disintegration. And he just starts going on and on. This guy who does this, I guess you could call it bro country, he yeah. was so excited to talk about Disintegration with me, you know, and I was like, wow, this record just really has affected everyone. I mean, the last person I would have thought would be excited about The Cure just all he wanted to do I'm like we gotta do the actual interview we can't just do it all about the he just wanted to talk about the care with me and specifically that record and that really impressed me uh, I, I, we should uh, we're gonna wrap this up in a second but but Laurie and Mike I, you guys wanna sort of just weigh in on the album where it fits for you in the in the the canon of, of Cure music and well I think a lot of what Lindsay said for me holds true and I, I think when Michael started the conversation by saying that this is like a dark side of the moon for our generation when I look at mm-hmm. a lot of the new wave bands that I like I always say Duran Duran came out of the canon perfectly formed their first album is great yeah their second album is even better the Cure work up to their masterpiece. Mm. So does U2. So does Depeche Mode. And I think that's why these albums are so epic at the end of the 80s. They actually, they, they took time to become who, you know, well, first of all, The Cure is so many different bands throughout their career, but they right. take the time to grow to that epic 
high point of their career. And bands don't always get that time anymore to develop. And that's what is so great about The Cure's 40-plus year career, but disintegration. They had the time to, to become the band that made disintegration. Mm. Yeah, you make a good point, Lori. It's like how many bands out there could be the next Cure if they had 10 years to work up to their best record, you know, that kind of artist development. We don't really see that anymore. No. Yeah, I agree Greta with Van Fleet. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, right. Spinal Van Tap. I, I, agree, I agree with all that. I, I think that the thing that makes The Cure so unique is that through their music, um, not just their look, but through their music, they cre have created a world a world that is their own, and I think that disintegration is the epitome of that world. It's the expression, the best possible expression of that world for a Cure fan. So, I mean, that's that's what the album means to me. It was a life-changing changing experience. I was not a teenager, and it still meant a tremendous amount to me, even at that time. And, um, you know, listening to it now, it, it uh, as Gary Delabate would say, it holds up, <laughs> and it holds up well. So... <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the amazing panel for weighing in and, and really uh, kind of underscoring how important this record is. It was uh, a fantastic day, and I, I think that, you, you know, the one area, I'll just, I'm, I'm on, in public, I'm going to air this out here. I think the one area where we may have failed the listeners a bit is we didn't really get much more information on the new Cure record. <laughs> That's as much uh, as anybody's gotten. Let's just say it's epic. He okay, didn't thank seem like you. He was going to spell much. He no, was not spelling. No, no. You, well, you heard him start <laughs> yep. to say yeah, he what town slept. they were recording almost in, and pulled himself and then he back. Slept. So I, I, I don't feel like we, you know, that we slacked yeah. off on our end. We yeah. got a little morsel there. <laughs> um, so we, we did our best.